Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my analysis into uh, the critical thinking series. And as we saw in the last section, section one of the critical thinking series, the whole point of um, my attempt to walk you gradually through um, each section of this critical thinking series is to demonstrate that we can start with very, very simple concepts, very basic concepts. Recognize a pattern in those concepts, and then once we've attained pattern recognition, complicate those concepts and thus the pattern um, until we get to a point at which the, the pattern is so complex that you know only a very small group of well-trained individuals have typically been able to make sense of these patterns. Um, what I want to show you is my whole responsibility, I guess in a sense my obligation that I've assumed on my own volition, it's not like I'm conforming to some, some moral claim or something, my own volition, is I want to show the world uh, and, and my viewers that you can do this, right? You don't have to be a PhD, you don't have to be um, a you know, professional mathematician or computer science person or logician in order to be able to do these very, very, very technical, very complex um, analyses, right? This lecture series is not a logic series, right? This is like an intro to logic series. This lecture series today, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about things that are applied heavily in, um, in biological sciences and in statistics. Statisticians use um, the modeling that I'm going to talk about today quite a bit, but this is not a static uh, um, statistics um, lecture, right? This is, not a, this is not anything other than a lecture and a series devoted entirely to helping you think critically. Uh, and it's important because no matter what field you go into, from business to art to philosophy to politics to, to so social work, uh, all disciplines require critical thinking skills. So hopefully uh, this will help contribute to a more critical society. Okay, so this is critical thinking. And uh, we are doing um, section two. And we're doing section two of the uh, analysis. Okay, um, the title of this analysis is Heuristic Modeling from Three Forms of Analogies. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll explain all of this in a second, right? So, heuristic modeling. Again, as we did in the last section, the, the discussion on uh, heuristic mod modeling and uh, what, what I'll describe in a second as analogical relations, um, it starts off very, very basic, but by the end of the analysis, it will get very, very complex. Um, and what I'm going to do is design what I've done, is to design the lecture in such a way that by the time we arrive at the end of the section, just like in the end of section one, there'll be an opportunity for you um, to implement the ideas that you've learned, the concepts that you've learned here, to try and arrive at an answer. So hopefully this will, this will actually help prepare you to better, um, to better think critically. That's the whole point of the series. If I'm just giving you the answer, then it's not, it's not really going to be beneficial. You need to be able to implement the stuff that I'm teaching in order for you to critically arrive at um, the correct conclusions. So, Basically, anytime, just generally, anytime we're talking about heuristic models, I'm not going to go into the whole breakdown of it. That's not the intent of this series. But anytime we're talking about heuristic models, for the middle of page four, we're just talking about explanatory models, models that help in the explanation of some phenomena, some set of circumstances, right? So anytime we're talking about heuristic models, They help to explain an explanatory model. I can. This is basically a fancy way of saying, okay, I want you to design a model that explains this set of circumstances in the world. Design a model that helps me make sense of the fact that these patterns reproduce in these, you know, these particular segments of society or these particular species of indigenous blah 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 blah. Right. It's just an explanatory model. 
the good thing about um, what I'm about to teach you is I think once you really understand, once you truly understand how to implement heuristic models, and I'll talk about this in a second, there are applications for this that are just, I think, really, really cool. Um, and I'm not gonna jump up the gun. I've implemented this idea of heuristic modeling in the real world to do some pretty interesting stuff. And I, I don't want to spoil it, but in a second, I'll tell you exactly what those things are and how I went about doing it. Okay, so three forms of analogies. As you guys know, we always start super basic and, uh, and then we complicate it. So it's important, it's absolutely essential that when we're in the basic phase, right, when we're in the ghetto philosophy phase, right, where it's just sort of a given, um, make sure that you understand solidly what it is that I'm discussing because as we move to the next part, it'll, it'll get gradually more and more complicated, right? So let's make sure that, you know, for the next 10 or 15 minutes that you really get what I'm about to get into. Okay, so three forms of analogies. And um, we're going to make an assumption, right, with respect to the three forms of analogies. We're going to assume that A is like B. When we're talking about an analogy, sort of in a linguistic sense, this thing is like this thing, right? So let's assume that A is like B. A is like B. A is like B. This is our pattern, right? This is our pattern. The thing about critical thinking is, you know, it's a, it's a sort of fancy way of talking about the implements, the conditions for pattern identification, right? This, this would be a very, very good way of training um, individuals who are put in positions where they have to analyze complex data, complex information. You can imagine statisticians for the NFL or the NBA, um, people in business who have to analyze complex relationships, obviously scientists, obviously individuals within government, obviously teachers as far as assessment. A lot of this is um, typically used for um, within the educational fields, curriculum design and such, right? So the pattern is very, very, very simple. The pattern, remember, we're gonna start simple, right? A is like B, so that's our, that's our pattern. You'll see that that very basic concept by the end of the series, an hour and a half, two hours from now, will be, uh, will be, will take it to a whole nother level. So there's three forms then, the first form is what's known as a positive analogy, right? A positive analogy. Positive analogy, and the first thing is, well, what is a positive analogy? A and B, in this relationship, A is like B, right? In this relationship, they share properties, right? In the relationship, A is like B, they share properties, right? A and B share. Right? A and B, where's my red marker? A and B share. Right? They share properties. Insofar as we're talking about this relationship, the relationship A is like B is known as an analogical relationship, right? The, the, the type of relationship is an analogical, A-N-A-L-O-G-I. Right? The type of relationship, this type of pattern that we're talking about is known as an analogical pattern, an analogical relationship. It's a big mouthful, but it's very simple. All it means is I'm saying two things are similar, right? This is like that, okay? Or, as we'll see in a second, this is not like that. So a positive analogy, is the first of the three forms, and it basically says A and B, A and B share properties. I'll discuss that in a second. And I've listed the properties, P1, P2, P3, all the way out to Pn. Okay, number two is a negative analogy, right? Negative analogy. And all this says is A and B do not share properties, right? Simple enough. A and B do do not share properties. Right? A and B do not share properties. Okay. 